It took me years to really understand that to have a real genuine thought that you can feel, it takes time. And I needed years to understand that, oh, if I wanted to animate, I could do it off of a computer or from not looking at a screen. And so I found that serendipitously through a chance encounter with a broken fan. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Anyone who is driven by a car dealership in the United States has probably seen them. Inflatable nylon figures with smiley faces bending and twisting in the breeze. These roadside attention getters are known in the marketing world as tube men or sky dancers. The artist Paul Chan calls them breathers, and they have played a central role in his practice since he debuted his own uncanny renditions of the dancers in 2017 at Green Naftali Gallery in New York. The swaying figures also symbolize the artist's own winding approach to his practice and the need, sometimes, to take a breather. After working primarily with video early in his career, including violating sanctions to shoot a video essay in Baghdad during the U.S. occupation, Chan grew exhausted by screens. He left art production for five years and opened his own book publishing house, the beloved indie outfit Badlands Unlimited, which has put out eclectic titles ranging from Saddam Hussein's speeches on democracy to the interactive ebook What is a Kardashian? Chan made his return to visual art after realizing that those car lot tube men could be turned into off screen animations. Now, the Breathers are the centerpiece of a major solo show at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, open through July 16th. Artnet News' deputy editor, Rachel Corbett, sat down with Chan, a recent winner of the MacArthur Genius Grant, to talk about the tyranny of screens, his early adoption of crypto, and the importance in every artist's life of simply taking a break. Hi, Paul. Thanks so much for joining us today on The Art Angle. I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm a huge admirer for many years, so this is really a pleasure for me. Hey, it's great to be here. I'd like to go back and start in your earlier years in the 2000s, a period when you were involved in a lot of activism. You broke U.S. sanctions to go to Baghdad in 2002. You made these posters for a publication called The Occupied Wall Street Journal and helped raise funds for organizations like Planned Parenthood, the ACLU. And so I thought it was interesting that you've also said that you try to keep your political work separate from your artistic practice in some ways. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how you see this distinction? I think the distinction comes mainly from my particular experience in politics. Before anyone knew me as an artist, I had a fairly robust career as a political organizer. I was a labor organizer in the mid to late 90s. I worked with the first part-time teachers union called PFACT, based at Columbia College in Chicago. I worked with certain segments of the Teamsters Union, organizing strikes across the nation, in particular the UPS strike in the late 1990s. I was an immediate person for the large protest that was known later on as Seattle 99, the Seattle protests. And so I've always had both feet in what I thought was interesting and what I thought was worthy of my attention politically, which in the late to mid-90s was label organizing. In the early 2000s, it was anti-war. And it just goes on because I'm just interested. And so my experience in political organizing comes from a very particular notion of what politics is. Because of that, I wanted to keep that experience real and keep it as on the ground as I could. As people started to know me as an artist, it seemed clear to me that even though art can be political, can work for a kind of social good, can be engaged in a way, way beyond what we normally think of as exhibitions, in galleries and museums and not-for-profit spaces. It seemed also to me that that was a kind of political experience that I wasn't a party to. 
that I didn't have much experience in. And so it was important to me to keep them distinct, at least in my mind, so that I can more effectively do what I wanted to do. Was there a period in which you thought you might go into a different career, like in, say, labor organizing or something political? I think at a certain point in my life, I thought I was going to be in jail a lot. <laughs> and, and so I'm happy that path didn't pan out. I think there, you know, maybe this is particular to New York. I'm not sure. There are many ways to be in the arts besides being a artist who shows in galleries and museums, or even to make a finer distinction, a commercial contemporary artist who shows in commercial venues along with not-for-profit venues. When I was younger, it didn't occur to me that being an art simply meant being a commercial contemporary artist. It just occurred to me that I wanted to make things and to keep myself interested as I was making things. And so it just turned out that I became a commercial contemporary artist. You embody many of those roles in the arts yourself as obviously a publisher too, which I want to talk about more later. So I think you've still managed to wear all of those different hats and show that being a commercial artist is not the only way. I agree. And maybe I can lean on your experience as a writer and talk about how if you were tasked to write the same thing over and over again, I think life would be a little boring. And through the boringness, you may feel like your senses are being deprived of their full capacity. Is that the case? For sure. And so I think those many hats that you talk about may simply be me trying to live and work in such a way that my senses don't atrophy. I think curiosity is the pleasure principle of thought. I truly believe that. And I've been lucky enough or dumb enough to think that the curiosity can lead me to experiences and work that will allow me to retain a sense of satisfaction and interest in whatever it is that I do. And that may mean making artwork, but it can also perhaps mean making posters for people or books or not doing anything in particular. When you were making your earlier video installations and then you said that you decided you hated, maybe not hated screens, we're very tired of screens and really couldn't bear the uh, thought of making art on them anymore. I wonder if that's similar to what you're talking about now, that feeling of doing the same thing over and over again. And also because screens, of course, are beyond just your art practice. They're everywhere in life more and more. And then, in fact, you made this body of work that involved video projectors that had no screen to project anything on. So they were these completely useless objects brought down. So I'm wondering if that's what you were feeling and what drew you away from those early video works. I think you've characterized it right. I mean, that's how I would say it. Uh, I was tired. I think back in the mid to late 2000s, I've had a fairly intense time making fairly intense work that comes out of projectors, whether they're projected onto the floor or specially mounted screens or on unorthodox walls. And I was very grateful for the opportunity to have shown them. But I think around 2007, 2008, I was tired of screens and tired of projected images. Back then in the Stone Ages, smartphones were just coming to the fore. But I could see the writing on the wall. You could see that these phones would be able to play videos at a higher definition than what we would ever know. And now it seems normal that you can watch a whole movie or hours and hours of YouTube videos of some lecture on your phone, no problem. But back then it was novel. The ubiquity of the screens was coming and it tired me thinking about it. It wasn't exciting. It was a little depressing. And it was moreover depressing because the dominant thread in my work at the time were screen-based. And so I think I needed to choose, or at least I had to acknowledge that I was freaking tired 
of screens. And the question then becomes, what do I do about it? Yeah, I think that's pretty prescient because that's how I feel now for sure. It's terrible, right? It's just terrible. <laughs> Can I ask you, do you write on a screen? Do you write by yes. hand? Do you write on a screen? Well, it's funny because when I'm thinking something through, like when I have a germ of an idea that I want to develop, I actually go find that I write it by hand on paper and kind of draw lines connecting thoughts. But when I want to actually create the text, I go and I write it directly on the screen. It's ruined my eyes. I go from screen to screen all day long. I, <laughs> but it's interesting. I think it is interesting that there's still some part of my brain that instinctively rejects the screen, like the deeper thought part of my brain. <laughs> it is a, an essay for an enterprising art historian someday. <laughs> yeah. Because, sure. you know, I think the act of reading and writing is much more full-bodied than we'll ever admit, I think. Hmm. I'm with you when I start to write. I write by hand. And I don't think it's because I want to feel like I'm Oscar Wilde. I think it's because <laughs> I think the act of moving your hand in a particular way with the touching of the paper, perhaps even with the smell of the ink that we may not register consciously, but is still there, I think puts us into a particularly different kind of attention than, say, when we look at a screen. And that attentiveness, I think, gives us that feeling of having something more substantive, or at least substantively, qualitatively different than when we type on a screen. I agree, and I almost wonder if it feels slightly more permanent. Like, once you mark it down, you kind of want to say it a little bit more correctly when you're marking it down versus a computer when you know you can just delete it all in one second. I agree. Sure yeah. yeah. No, I'm with you. It's like whether or not that's true is almost irrelevant because clearly we can strike things off of a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. But the paper trail of those marks become a quality rather than a mistake, right, of, mm -hmm. of the thinking process, which I think I appreciate in terms of its physicalness and also in terms of its paper trailness. Yeah, exactly. This is just curiosity. How do you feel about screens now? I mean, do you use an iPhone? Do you watch videos on it? Do you ever think about making work again on screens? I don't plan mm -hmm. to, uh, to make screen works anymore. It's too interesting making the breathers and mm -hmm. it's really a world for me now. And so to be lost in this world and to see what else this world is capable of will most likely take up at least two lifetimes. But in terms of screens, I have an iPhone, but it's from 1842. And the screen is cracked, actually. I dropped it on a hike in a national park. I've kept this phone mostly because the screen is so cracked that every time I use it, I get glass shards on my fingers and uh, <laughs> it hurts slightly, but I don't mind it. I think I'm desensitized so much that I don't feel it, but also I like <laughs> the feeling of actually feeling something as I touch the screen, so. Very interesting. I definitely want to get into the breather soon because I'm super excited to talk about that. But first, I do want to get into a little bit about the break you took from art making. You continued to work, of course, you know, you made your publishing house Badlands Unlimited. Can we just tell a little about what precipitated that break? Because I think it then relates into the breathers and other bodies of work. I had reached peak screen. I had reached an impasse about what I wanted to make. On the one hand, I wanted to keep making work. On the other hand, the kind of work that I was making were being done on a platform or a medium that I couldn't bear looking at anymore. So that's a real pickle which I couldn't figure out right away. I suppose I could have just kept making them, put my head down and lean on the old Protestant work ethic, but I'm not Protestant enough to do that. And I might be too lazy to do that. And so that was one reason. I think another reason also is I'm not old necessarily, but I'm not young. And I don't know if you remember in the mid to late 2000s, there was real excitement about contemporary art, I think in a way that made it global. 
that made it sort of, in a way, very festive and vivid for people beyond contemporary art in terms of the art events and the art fairs that was happening. It was very robust, I would say, contemporary art economy. And I think because of that, there were many opportunities for contemporary artists in all stations of life to show and to benefit from it. But I think the hard part about that is that you feel like you're in a circus and that at a certain point, it felt as if my production cycle wasn't my own anymore. That I think I felt like I was in a circus and I wanted to leave the circus. I was very grateful again for the opportunities, but I was kind of done. And I wanted to know what else I could do. And so between peak screen, being tired of being in a circus and being dumb, I thought, well, why don't I just stop? Why don't I give that a try? And that's what I did. And so this is from like, say, 2009-ish? Almost 2008, really. The last major work that I did was Sod for Sod's Sake, which I basically finished in early 08. It was shown later. But my timeline is really about what I make as opposed to what I show. So around 2008, I was already kind of done. So how did you find yourself getting into publishing and creating Badlands? I've always wanted to publish books, but I didn't have the money. That's one thing. The other thing is, like I said before, there are many ways to be in the arts. And I think before anyone knew me as an artist, I hung out with zine makers. And I was a fellow traveler in the sort of zine culture in the mid to late 90s. I would write for and help people put together zines. Zines like Punk Planet, Maximum Rock and Roll, mostly punk zines, but also some art zines. And so I had experience making media. And media at that time in the late to mid 90s was, you know, zines and some video, but mostly paper publications. And certainly it came in handy with the political work when we were making flyers for the UPS strike, for instance, or when there was a newspaper strike in Detroit. In Baghdad, for instance, I spent a third of my time at a print shop where they had a large scale printer that could help the activist group I was working with print large anti-war signs in Baghdad. In the middle of the queue, the print shop would be printing signs for a new chicken restaurant or a sign for Saddam Hussein. It was surreal. But I've had a long history of print production. And when I stopped making work, I tried to figure out what else I can do. And I think the thing that I landed on was the idea of starting a press, not just to make zines and artist books, but to make books that I used to read. I didn't grow up reading artist monographs. I didn't grow up reading big books that weigh 100 pounds and cost $65. I read trade paperbacks that cost $10.95 and I could put in my back pocket or steal in my backpack. And so that was the kind of book that I wanted to publish. And so that's how Badland started. And then it seems like the titles you publish, they're wide ranging. I think the first one I read was actually The Incredible On Democracy by Saddam Hussein. <laughs> which, <laughs> you read that. Which, <laughs> yeah, I think that was the first one I ever got and it was kind of just irresistible, that title. And, I, and I'm guessing maybe came out of your experience in Iraq. I'm not sure. Yeah, that was a gift from an activist who thought that I had a perverse enough sense of humor to want to see it. <laughs> and he was right. Yeah, right. So I see traces of you in many of the titles, you know, ideas that you've worked on and sometimes not. And I'm just curious what interests you, what makes you want to publish a book? Like I said, I had experience doing print publications and wanted to try out publishing trade paperbacks or hardcover books. Also, you know, you might remember at the time that ebooks were on the ascent. And I thought I can get away with making really cheap books by not making paper books at all. You know, Badlands started out as an ebook only publisher. And one of the reasons is because ebooks essentially are just dumb web pages that are monetized through a particular platform, you know, through Apple and Amazon. 
So I thought. So you well, wait till you were okay with screens at that point for this reason. I, yeah, yeah, that's so, true. That's okay. true. <laughs> okay. That's true. And of course, it was because of the economics. I, it was cheaper right. for me to make ebooks and to distribute them as ebooks than spend the thousands of dollars publishing a paper book that most likely would not sell and would sit in my studio for years. And so we started making ebooks. We ended up making more paper books, but that's how it started. And also, it's a different relationship to making things, making a book. You've published books, so you know that you can't do it alone. You need other people. To me, book production is very social. It reminds me a little bit of Waiting for Godot in New Orleans. It reminds me a little bit of theater in terms of production. A book at its heart may have one author, but the book itself is comprised of many hands and voices. And I appreciated that about Badlands and about making books in general. The books that we published at Badlands may have a kind of certain spirit that may come from my interests. But I will also say that without the people around me, the young artists and writers who I worked with, they would not have been the same at all. And their spirit is also in those books. That was what was so appealing about Badlands. Mm -hmm. And Badlands accepted crypto early on, right? Yeah, I believe we are the first art book publisher to accept crypto as a form of payment for books and artwork. We began doing it at the New York Art Book Fair, which at the time was at MoMA PS1 in 2011. We put out a sign. One person, I think, asked us about it. And we kind of on and off kept doing it at the New York Art Book Fair. And it wasn't only until 2017 that I think someone actually bought something from us using crypto. Uh-huh. Now, of course, this new book you have from Badlands, Wisdom from Tominaga Nakamoto, a philosopher, and which has a lot to do with Bitcoin. So I'm, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit, bit about, first of all, why you wanted to offer using crypto at Badlands and also why this new book has come out. You obviously have an interest in this subject. When I started Badlands, one of the ambitions was that Badlands was going to be a vendor on the Silk Road. Do you remember the Silk mm. Road? Yeah, yeah. So the Silk Road, for people who don't know, is an illicit dark web market that was founded by Ross Uprecht, this young man who started this dark, dark web market you could basically buy anything on it. And one of the ambitions for Badlands was to not only sell works online on a regular website and also try to sell works at the New York Art Book Fair, but also be a vendor on the Silk Road so that we can sell artworks and books through the dark web. And so as we were researching how to do that, we realized that in order to be a vendor on the Silk Road, you had to use something called Bitcoin. And so the education about Bitcoin was really about being a vendor on the Silk Road. Uh, <laughs> Interesting, wow. And so Silk Road was closed and Ross Uprecht has now three life sentences on his hand for running the Silk Road. But that's how I became aware of it. And the more I became aware of it, the more interested I got in terms of the technology. Because for me, uh, it's not just a digital currency, but really a form of publishing. And I think that's one of the sort of my abiding interests in cryptocurrencies, in particular Bitcoin, that whatever people may think of it, and many people think about it all the time, and people have many different opinions and thoughts about it. One of the things I think about it is that it's a form of publishing. Because to me, the blockchain is essentially a giant piece of automatic writing. And when I first learned about Bitcoin and the blockchain, that's how I saw it. It may be because I was a publisher, but I still think that's the case. And so my abiding interest in crypto really is 
sort of multi-dimensional, I suppose. Uh, but one of them, interestingly, is that it's publishing. That's interesting. I've never thought about it in those terms. Why did you want to sell on the Silk Road? Were there certain markets you were hoping to reach that you couldn't otherwise? Yeah, people who had no idea about art and culture, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I go back to the idea that curiosity is the pleasure principle of thought. I was beginning to understand the art book distribution economy. I think I kind of understand, although that's probably a real reach, about the distribution economics of art. But I didn't know the economics of the dark web. And I was curious. And mm -hmm. so I just thought, why not give it a go? It never worked out, but I think the experience was interesting. And I learned something from it. Mm hmm. So I do want to go back into how you went back into sort of more traditional art making. I think for me, it was finding a new reason to make work by realizing that I can animate without having the screen or a video projection be a part of the animation. I think in general, we need time to think. Maybe it's obvious for people, but for someone like me who's been poisoned by the history of philosophy so much because I have a weird, peculiar passion for it, that's a real revelation. Because so much of Western philosophy talks about how thought is and thinking is timeless. And it's a curious idea. And I understand the motivation that you want to believe that a good thought will last a lifetime and that it will last in perpetuity. But that also means that it's as if thinking doesn't take any time. It should just come instantly to you, you know, like the taste of bitterness in some fruit. And it's just not true. It took me years to really understand that to have a real genuine thought that you can feel, it takes time. And I needed years to understand that, oh, if I wanted to animate, I could do it off of a computer or from not looking at a screen. And so I found that serendipitously through a chance encounter with a broken fan. And I think I've been different ever since. I didn't think that I was going to keep making work. I made work that I call works on strike that I think may be works but may not be. They may simply be me torturing video projectors, like you said, the non-projections, the projectors that don't project anything. But it was really an encounter with a broken fan that made me realize that I could animate again. And that was it. I've been different since. What was the fan blowing on, <laughs> or what did it do? Oh, are you ready for a story, Rachel? I'm so ready. <laughs> That's what we're here for. I was in a studio space that had previously been used by artist Rachel Harrison. And in this space, as I was working in there, was a fan. And I was just putzing around, and I noticed the fan that Rachel had left behind. And it was a typical sort of fan that you get at, you know, a hardware store. It's a floor fan. It sat on the floor. It wasn't big. It was like a home fan but it was broken so that you couldn't pivot it at all. You can't change the angle of how the air blew. It would only blow towards the ceiling, right? And I turned it on and I started looking at it and I thought, huh, that kind of looks like those fans that you see at used car dealerships where there'd be a piece of fabric tube strapped on it and it looked like an animated figure that looked like it was on meth trying to get your attention so that you would buy a used car. And I kept looking at it and I realized, huh, that's a form of animation. They're moving. But instead of looking at a screen, you're looking at a piece of fabric being animated by air. And then I kept looking at it for a couple of days, in fact, and I thought, huh, Maybe I could make one of those tubes and see what it'd be like and strap it on this fan. And at that point, I had never sewn before. I'd worked the fabric just a tiny bit, but on collages and things. I don't know what those sky dancers, those tube men that you see at malls and parking lots, I don't know what they were made of. I don't know how they were made. I knew nothing about sewing machines, pattern making. 
but curiosity got the best of me. So I worked with my assistant at the time, Cassie, and she knew a little bit about sewing. So I drew up something, we bought the fabric, she taught me how to sew a little, and then we sewed it together, and we made this very pathetic looking tube. It wasn't even a tube, it was like a tube, and then at the tip of the tube, it was a point, because I didn't know how to make a seam, I just didn't know. And then we sewed two very thin arms on it, very long, thin arms, and we strapped it on with tape onto the fan, and we turned it on, and it filled up with air, so it stood up, and it stood around eight, nine feet tall, and then it just slowly drooped in the middle. So it looked as if this tube man was having a cardiac arrest. He was having a heart attack because he was just bent over. It's interesting because there was nowhere for the air to escape, right? Because I had close sewn the top closed. So the air was coming back out of the fan. And this dynamic made it so that not only did it fold in half, it didn't fold all the way though. It looked like it was keeled over and it was slightly moving. It looked as if he or she or they were just trying to catch their breath because they're having a heart attack. And I was smitten after that. I thought, wow, I can make something look like they're having a heart attack or an asthma attack. And I just loved the minute movement of this figure. And that was it. And I've never looked back. In case people haven't, seen them in person. These are these kind of air-filled tubular nylon figures that you see outside of like car lots, correct? Or how would you describe them? They have faces sometimes. Yeah, I think maybe the technical term for them are sky dancers. Sky dancers, okay. And you see them at malls. The places I've seen them are used car dealerships. And but sometimes you see them in front of restaurants when they're opening. Like Popeyes down the street in Brooklyn had one, uh, (laughs) which I thought was kind of nice. I saw a breather's show at Green of Tali a few years back, and I think that's where you debuted them in the U.S. at least. And they're made of these really simple seeming materials. I mean, you have to see them because they're surprisingly poignant. I was really blown away because they're somehow humanoid. The movements are very uncanny. And they do convey a lot of emotion somehow, like a guy who can't breathe or a guy who's killed over having a heart attack. I mean, you do get that sense, and I'm not quite sure why. But then what I didn't know at the time is how much you were actually involved in the choreography and that each has its own movements that you create and that I believe are inspired by gestures you've seen in your own life. Is that right? And can you describe what inspired these movements and how you actually make that happen? Sure, it's all true. To me, what I'm expressing most is the movement through the breathers. The shapes come second, perhaps even a distant second. I think maybe the way to talk about them is to talk about how I see or don't see. I'm nearsighted. I've been nearsighted since I was young, 11 or 12, so I can't see very far. Anything three or four feet away from me is blurry. And so I should wear glasses, but I don't and I haven't. And it's mostly because I'm vain. I think I look terrible in glasses. And so even at a young age, I refused to wear them. And I think that got me in trouble because I couldn't see. I could see some things, but not much. But I was stubborn and so I refused to wear them. But what was interesting is that over time, I felt like I adjusted, I adapted. And I developed a way of seeing where it didn't depend upon sharpness or detail for me to recognize things. I leaned on being able to recognize things based on their movement. So for instance, if we saw each other and chatted for some time, and then I met you in person, at some point, I may be able to recognize you down the street, even though I couldn't recognize your face. But what I might be able to do is recognize how you moved how you walked. And that's been true for years for me, that I recognize people through their movement, through their gait, through their hand gestures, through their motion. And so movement becomes very important to me. And in many ways, even the early animations betray that. Because 
for me, it kind of didn't matter what I drew in terms of the vivid sort of sharp pixelated animations I did in the early to mid 2000s. It only mattered how they moved. That was what I was focusing on really. And so the breathers become my way of extending that enthusiasm for movement, my need for movement beyond the screen. And so the breathers really are portraits of certain motions or movements that I care about or come from people I care about or people I want to make fun of or, you know, situations I've seen in my life, whether on the street or at a dance or at whatever. And so how I make the breathers generally tend to be by thinking of a movement first and then trying to figure out the shape that it would take so that the movement is possible through the mechanics of a fabric shell strapped onto a particular fan. That sounds like a very different learning curve, which kind of shape would create a certain movement. I mean, it must have taken a lot of trial and error, I suppose. Rachel, it was a nightmare. It's, <laughs> I, I live in my own nightmare of my own making, really. <laughs> uh, that it's almost impossible. I can say with absolute certainty that whenever I start a breather, the first version is 100% of the time wrong. It never flies the way that I want it to. But I've done it for years now, and I think through trial and error and through a real sort of focus on this weird methodology that I've essentially invented for myself, you kind of get a feel for it. I kind of understand now what shape combined with what air pressure combined with what kind of fabric will allow me to make it look as if someone is drowning or if someone is ecstatic, either from the presence of someone else or through some sort of pharmaceutical. Mm. And, and I think it's doable now. It's certainly not perfect. And it's a lifetime of sort of research and understanding, but it feels like it's a kind of attention I'm willing to give. I was going to ask you for a couple of examples of what those gestures are, movements that were meaningful in your own life that you wanted to recreate. I think maybe you just gave a couple. I think one salient one for me is there was a work in the last Green of Tali show in the front room that is as close to a self-portrait as it gets. Mm. And it's a singular breather with arms clasped together, holding what looked like a very light towel. But it looks as if it's struggling, holding onto that towel and lifting that towel. And it's the movement of me having an asthma attack. And mm. uh, it took, I think, 40 something iterations for that breather to come about. All the breathers that you see have multiple prototypes, upwards of 40. And that means in my studio, I have 20 to 30 full-size versions of those breathers that don't fly right. Like I said, that's the nightmare that I have built for myself. It sounds like some kind of, like one of those fun houses you see in a horror movie. <laughs> like, it, that's so true. Just, you know. And I have no one to blame but myself. But I kind of <laughs> love it. You know, I think people should have lives, but I don't want a life. I just want to make these. <laughs> I do want to ask you about the Walker Show, of course, and the breathers are at the very center of it. It's called On Breathers and the Value and Pleasure of Work. That title sums up a lot of the subjects we've been talking about here. I'm curious how involved you were in the show and also in, you know, making this body of work as the centerpiece of it, oh, whether that uh, was all the curators. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't all the curators, but I couldn't have done it without them. In particular, Pavel Pish, who's the Walker curator who invited me to show at the Walker. So he approached me, I think 2019 maybe, and he asked me if I was interested. And I wasn't interested, but talking to him over time, it seemed to me that it was worth working with him. And so we sort of batted around ideas. And I think we settled on the idea of calling the show Breathers. And what's cool about it for me is that it surfaces, it centers the recent work that I've been doing called Breathers. But also he was open and interested in the idea of 
breathers in another way, which is the idea of taking a break, taking a breather. And I love that idea that I think in many ways, it's a kind of a meta title that not only does show center on the breather's work, but also the idea of what it means to take a break and what you do during a break or what actually a break is, what a breather is, what it can give you, what it can't give you, what it is in relations to what you were doing before. And so I think conceptually it was very rich that way, which is in a way also why a lot of the Badlands work is in the show, along with some of the what I call the arguments work and the non-projections work, because they all in a way are emblematic of a certain break that I took from what I had been doing before. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I'm just curious because you said you didn't want to do the show at first, which is surprising because I would think a lot of artists would jump at the chance to have a museum show at the Walker. What was your hesitation? I think Occam's razor is key here. I think the simpler answer is that I'm lazy and that, <laughs> uh, and that I didn't want to take time away from what I was into at that time and still am now. And to make time for those things becomes one of those sort of experiments in living that I've tried to give myself. Yeah, I think that couldn't be more timely a sentiment than now with everyone working from home and there being no separation and, you know, we're watching screens all day long and there's very little attention for thought and curiosity. And that the pleasure principle, which I love (laughs) that you say, you know, we lose out on that more and more, it feels like. Yeah, I agree. And I think to me, what we lose out on most are choices and options that are not self-evident or given. I think if we believe Duchamp, that what is important in a way is not the art, but the creative act. It may mean simply reorienting ourselves to see that creative act manifesting in more than art and what that would look like and how that would play out in all aspects of social and political life. I think that's an important idea, especially now, as you say, because everyone is so tired and overworked, overburdened. And I think we all know that when we're overworked and overburdened, we can't think straight. And when we can't think straight or think rightly or think clearly, we may not also be able to think creatively to give ourselves choices where none are evident or given, and to think of other ways of doing things. And that to me is very important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's a good note to leave it on. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sony Manalili, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. Music